friends, welcome to Holy Trinity Church here in St Austell, Cornwall. I am here today to show you the magnificent pipe organ, which you may have heard me playing in several videos I have recorded recently. Firstly, here is some information about the history of the organ. Back in 1820, a barrel organ was purchased for this church at a cost of £150 this being the fashion of the time. It was placed in the gallery, which used to be at the west end of the church. When the gallery was dismantled, when the church was restored in 1870, the barrel organ was recited in the position of the present organ. In March 1878, a resolution was passed to purchase a new organ, and so, a two-manual instrument was built by Messrs. Bryson Brothers and Ellis of London and duly installed at a cost of £750. In 1914, a third manual was added and the instrument was thoroughly overhauled and improved by a pneumatic action and an electric blower because it had previously been blown by hand. This work was done by Hugh and Co. of Plymouth and Exeter, who replaced Bryson's business tablets with their own. By 1970, the action had become unreliable and the pipes clogged with dust. As the pipe work is of such excellent quality, the parochial church council decided against selling the organ, and a complete restoration was undertaken by Mr. Morris Eglinton of Saltash, at a cost of £6,000. This included installing a new electro-pneumatic action and some new pipework in the pedal and grates departments, together with minor changes in the swell and choir. It is a fine instrument with crisp action and bright, clear chorus work. It contains 35 speaking stops nine couplers, and a useful complement of adjustable pistons to manuals and pedal. And I was baptised and brought up at this church, and so the sound of this organ at least has been quite familiar to me since I was quite small. And the sight of it too, because when I was in Sunday school or one-way club, we used to sit in the north aisle, where I am now sitting, with the organ in front of me, and I found the designs on the painted and stenciled pipes and the uh, carving and fretwork of the wood really quite fascinating. You can see the uh, patterns of uh, flowers and fleur de lis, and what looked quite like faces right at the top, and what looked to me rather like a row of dancing men below the wooden bar. And so uh, you can see the carving as well and the fretwork. And uh, around here is the organ console. And uh, here is the organ, as you can see it uh, from another angle. Another set of painted and stenciled pipes.
And now here is the console. There is the uh, switch for the blower and the switch for the lights as well as underneath there. And as you can hear, the blower is making quite a loud noise at the moment, which it shouldn't do. But uh, I'm assured that this is going to be seen to in the not too distant future. I have some information about the organ here, which comes from an issue of an old parish magazine called Vision, dating from February 1988. And I believe it was written by the organist at that time, who was Robert Christie, who I understand now plays at Bodmin. He says, you will see four keyboards, three for the hands, that is the manuals, there they are, and one for the feet, that's the pedals, there they are. The pedals are used for playing the deep notes for supporting the harmony. Open diapason pipes of 16 foot length produce a firm bass which is essential for keeping a congregation in time drawing hymns. Higher pitched stops, or sets of pipes, add Byton's definition, allowing the pedals to play a melody if required in certain classical organ music. When power and richness are needed, the organ's loudest stop can be added. This is called ophiclide, and its power is produced by a vibrating metal reed at the bottom of a long flared resonator. Like a giant trombone in appearance and impact, its effect is best reserved for the climax to a piece of loud music. The lower manual plays the choir organ. Misguided organ builders have assigned this section to the role of accompaniment for the choir, but the name originates from the days of organ galleries. A section of pipes placed behind the organist's chair or bench and projecting over the gallery rail would be used in contrast to the rest of the instruments placed in front or above the organist. The name chair organ became corrupted to choir and organs began to vacate the advantageous gallery position to be buried in sound restricting chancel chambers. This choir organ has four flute tone stops which produce the quiet sparkling sounds. There are two so-called string stops of such unpleasantness that it took an organ builder of real skill to entice sounds so vile from these pipes. Perhaps two extra flute stops could one day replace these unusual pipes and enhance the instrument's ability to play truly classical music. Two solo reed stops completes this little ensemble. And by the way, the opinion on this so-called string stops is Robert Christie's and not mine. The centre manual plays the great organ. There are two flute stops and six diapasons whose forthright incisive tone characterises the true organ sound. The diapason chorus alone has the weight and clarity to lead singing. A powerful trumpet tops the chorus, adding colour and brilliance. The top manual plays the swell organ. Its pipes are housed in a wooden box fitted with Venetian blinds type horizontal shutters to swell or diminish the volume of sounds. This is the most flexible manual, containing a mellow flute and two very soft strings. The diapason chorus balances the great organ and is topped by a pair of reed stops which combine to produce a rich blaze of colour. As I have already mentioned, 
This organ also has a very good complement of couplers and combination pistons, which allow you to draw out to particular groups of stops. You can see all the uh, foot levers for the combinations here. Swell, great, and pedal. And the uh, swell pedal there. And a foot lever for the uh, great pedal coupler. And underneath each spaniel, there were the thumb pistons. And the uh, couplers grouped to the relevant departments. Now, I have already spoken about the history of this fine instrument, but what about its future? Speaking in April 2016, I'm afraid it is in some doubt just at the moment, because it is in need of some repair, and it has been estimated that it would cost £70,000 to put it in correct order. And there are also plans afoot to alter the interior of this church quite radically, although these plans, as of yet, have not been firmly decided. Currently on display in the church is the plan of the building as it currently looks. There you have the organ in the corner and the chancel there and the uh, current vestry. But on display next to it are plans of these proposed alterations. Here you see that the organ has been replaced by a meeting room, which apparently is going to be on two levels. There's a proposal to build a new hall, and uh, it's also proposed to uh, replace the current pews with chairs. And, uh, put in a new balcony or mezzanine floor at the back, and also to move the fonts from its current position. But, as I have said, these plans are not firmly decided as yet. So, we pray that if it is God's will, the organ will be saved, but we pray that God's will will be done anyway, whether we like it or not. But for now, I hope you have enjoyed watching this video. Goodbye from Holy Trinity St. Austin.